All right, we'll, uh, we'll get going. So two more topics this afternoon. Um, so I'll take my, uh, my Open Compute Project Lead hat off and uh, uh, talk uh, a little bit about something that uh, we've been thinking about uh, at uh, Schneider Electric, APC by Schneider Electric. A um, little bit about me. Uh, so I've been at uh, APC and Schneider Electric for, for a while, uh, about 19 years. And uh, prior to that, I, uh, I got my feet wet in uh, critical facilities in, uh, in the uh, uh, nuclear-powered submarine force, um, which, which was a great indoctrination to, to how to run a, a critical plant, right? So uh, there's two big things that I, that I learned from that. First, it's a real big bummer to have a loss of electrical power when you're at depth. So that's number one. And two, uh, when you're in a steel pipe with a bunch of electronics and a, uh, and a nuclear power pan, it's another big bummer to lose air conditioning. It gets hot real quick. So not unlike uh, data centers. So, um, so you're here to, to, we're here to talk about a little bit of a data center IT pod. And uh, you know, my question to you is either, either you guys have an idea of what this thing is or you're here to learn what the heck I'm actually going to be talking about here, right? So most people I, I, I know can kind of visualize what, what this thing is, uh, an IT pod inside a data center, um, but, but a lot of don't. But the, but the thing is, there's not any real definitions around it. So this is how we, we view the, you know, the definition of an IT pod. So uh, there's IT devices. There's, if, we'll start from the bottom here. There's IT devices that go into IT racks, right? And, and this is where Open Compute has done a fantastic job of really defining what some of these options are from, from the IT devices and racks. Above that, these racks and, are going to be grouped into pods inside rooms inside a data center facility. So really, a, a pod is this uh, grouping of racks, usually a row. It's either a row or more likely a couple of rows that are going to have some shared facilities, whether it's power, maybe air containment, probably network architecture, and things like that. And so the question is, why do we really care about this grouping of, uh, of racks? You know, does it really matter if we, uh, if we need to specify it? So I'll make a kind of an analogy. Uh, I think there's enough people in the room that right, might remember in the uh, mid-90s, maybe, if you're building your first server room. You decided to uh, buy a baker's rack and stick some tower servers on top of that baker's rack and maybe tie wrap power strip to the back and plug this stuff in. And it worked pretty good when we were starting off. But then maybe you, you needed to get your second baker's rack to expand your tower server in your server rooms and it starts to get unmanageable, right? So you can't remember where the cards go. So stuff starts to get organized into an IT enclosure, which makes life a heck of a lot easier, uh, especially operationally and also organizationally from a, from a space perspective. And so a pod is going to perform a similar function to that to racks. Rather than having, uh, you can imagine, uh, you know, there are some traditional data centers where as you deploy racks out into a data center, if you just think of it from a power zone perspective, you know, you'll fill up a, maybe a power distribution unit as you, as you deploy the racks. And then maybe it goes some more, but your panel board's filled up. And so you decide to go steal some power from maybe a PDU on another side of the data center. Now, once your data center is filled up, operationally, it's going to be extremely difficult to understand what's feeding what power. Potentially, networking is the same thing. Okay, so pod's going to help bring organizational structure to it. And also, it's a good increment for large data centers if you want to deploy different architectures within the same room. So, uh, so the question I ask is, you know, if, if I were to describe a pod, you know, how big should it be? And you know what size? And when I say what size, that you know both size and power and physical size, right? And uh, you know how much power should it create? What kind of attributes is it going to have? Is it square? A little shout out to Vapor IO here, right? Is it round? Right? They're all different kinds of, of pods. And if you think about it from a systems engineering perspective, you think about this thing as a black box, right? You have power that goes in. There's an equivalent amount of heat that's going to come out that you have to remove. It's going to have a certain weight and size that has to be supported. And there's a certain amount of data that's going to go in and out of this thing. So you can kind of actually specify those and understand it. So when we talk about the size, there's really three main attributes to a pod. One is the total power that it's going to consume. Second is the rack density 
and third would be the amount of space that it takes up. And these are all coupled together, right? So the idea is you want to balance all of them when you're doing your data center planning. So we're going to uh, just examine these things and then also look at a few attributes that aren't related to size later. So from a power perspective, how big should a pod be? So when you look at, well, how do I get power to a, to a pod? And you look at your typical type of panel boards or subfeed breakers or busway that you can use, right? Some typical ones, you know, they may 225, a 250 amp, a 400 amp. There's some larger ones that might be useful for higher density, right? And you break them down internationally at the different voltages that are common, right? 400, 230, or 480, 277, or 208, 120. And you, you look at what, how much power those breakers can typically provide to a pod. Uh, it kind of start. It kind of falls out into kind of two nice sizes: a small size, which would be around 150 kW pod, and a larger one, which would be about a 250 kW pod. So, and these are pretty manageable deployments of power for for larger data centers. And, and in fact, it's funny when the 250 fell out. I've heard from a couple of different operators that said if they could optimally deploy you know, an increment of power, uh, they actually said, a couple of different people said 250 kW would be kind of a nice increment that I, could, that I could deploy. So it falls out. So you'll see with those combinations that, that it comes out. Now, there is a 70 kW and even smaller, and I kind of left that off because that might be more appropriate for smaller medium data centers. So if you look at this is a little bit of an example. So you have, uh, this is kind of a typical sort of configuration that you might see. You'd have 3,000 amp switch gear. Some of it's gonna res be reserved for your peak, you know, cooling loads and your chillers and air conditioners. The other half's gonna be dedicated potentially to IT gear. Larger data centers might have separate switch gear, but just into this example. And you can see that, hey, if I wanna do about half of it is pods, it's gonna be about five pods, so I can deploy five 250 kW pods on this particular piece of switch gear, then obviously you can step and repeat that switch gear inside a larger data center. So pretty, pretty straightforward. Those, those numbers are stuff that you've seen. So that's the power side. When you look at the physical space, you say, well, how big should a pod be, right? How long can I make a row? And um, it's a little bit mushy, but what, what you find is that um, there are some hard requirements in certain places from an OSHA requirement, you know, from an egress. So if you have like a contained aisle, exits have to be a certain distance. And as an example, in the US, if there's a dead end on one row, the nearest exit has to be like less than 20 feet. So you wouldn't want, if you have a dead end pod against a wall, you don't want it to be more than like 10 racks of 600 millimeter racks. Um, what we've typically seen is a, a nice, a sweet spot for, uh, for the larger size is going to be somewhere in the 20 to 25 rack range. And uh, for a couple of reasons, for those that do need to go around back, you know, it's, uh, you're not uh, getting out of breath going from the front of the rack to the back of the rack. Um, and, uh, you know, again, egress. But the, the best practice for size is you'd, for the room that you're going to be deploying these pods in, you'd want to try to get the largest one that matches the, the power capability that you have going to the pod and, and the density. And then modularity would be the, the, the other one. If you have a very, very uncertain growth plan, you might want to choose on the smaller side so that your risk and, and your capital expenditure is lower in case you grow slower than you expect to. So, uh, so rack density, and uh, this morning it was actually very interesting to hear talk about where rack density is going. And so we say, well, what do things look like? If I have a pod that's either 150 kW or 250 kW, and I look at some typical densities, what does that end up being in the number of racks for this pod? So we have a little table there that kind of shows you. So this really, if you want to simplify things down from a planning perspective, you can kind of say, a nice starting point is there's maybe six options of pod configurations, just from a size perspective, that you might want to start, again, from planning. And I'll give a couple examples, scenarios of what you might, how that, could, how that can work out. Now, when I talk about rack density, I am talking the average rack density in that pod. Okay, so total power in the pod divided by the number of racks. That does not mean you can't have 
a 1kW rack sitting next to a 20kW rack. Okay, the max density within that rack is really determined by the circuit that you decide to feed, feed that rack, right? Whether it's a, you know, a, a 20 amp, 120 volt single phase circuit, right? On the very, very low side, or maybe you wanna do a 32 amp, uh, you know, 400 volt uh, circuit on the, on the higher end. And uh, in containment, air containment is one of these things that gives us the ability to kind of mix and match your densities inside a pod as long as you hit the average for that pod. Okay. So here's a couple of little examples. I kind of did that 3,000 amp switch gear scenario. Uh, again, half of it's for cooling stuff. The other half might be for, uh, for the IT. So maybe uh, in a, uh, you know, uh, early days open compute scenario where the average rack density was about 8kW, you'd say, hey, I'm going to deploy uh, 30 rack, 30 rack pods, so 2 by 15, right, rows, uh, at 250kW, and you could do five of those in there. Or if uh, you maybe hit a university that's doing some high performance computing, they can deploy five pods at 250kW, but they're going to be much smaller, right? They're going to be only uh, 10 racks big because of the density that they have, but you're still maximizing the power that you're delivering to that pod. And uh, here's another example, co-location. They typically run at a much lower density because of the mix of customers that they have. So an average uh, of 6kW rack is not uncommon to, to see what happens for, for a co-location company. So those would be nice long, long rows. Again, still 250kW in this example. or Imagine a co-location that does want to deploy different variety of stuff. They can have a traditional pod of 40 racks, then maybe some open compute gear. The next pod's normal. The next one that rolls in is going to be a higher density, and then maybe they decide to do a high-performance high computing. Now, I've been focusing on power, and, and I haven't talked too much about cooling, and the, the assumption is that the bulk power that I'm delivering, I have the bulk cooling capability that matches it. Okay, so. That's just power and cooling are closely coupled together. Now, I visually made the last uh, image in intentional uh, to have all the varied pod sizes. Now, if you weren't planning to have those high density pods, you kind of look at that and, and you'd see a bunch of uh, wasted space. Um, so when you're looking at balancing the three things that would define the size of a pod, you want to maximize the power and, and cooling in parentheses first. Uh, you want to underestimate the density, which seems a little counterintuitive. And the reason you do that is because usually space is your cheapest commodity. Okay. Now, in the early days of data centers, what happened? You know, who here has heard white space is extremely expensive? Who is, who's heard that? Right? Because they took you know real estate people thinking square meters or square feet and they apply all the physical infrastructure of the power and the cooling and all that stuff to the size of the white space, and they say it's expensive. Well, in reality, the white space is not is what is expensive. It's all the power and cooling stuff. So if you look at that photo of the data center, that thing might be full. So it could be completely full data center, but it doesn't look like it. So what happens usually in, in, in a lot of enterprises, you'll have management come down who probably approve the budget for the data center, and they'll come down, it's like, why isn't the data center full? You guys are wasting my money. And you'll say it is full. He goes, well, it doesn't look like it's full, right? So it's, that's, a, that's a, uh, something that, that a lot of enterprises have to, have to get over. But not intuitive. So if you think, you know, I'm, hey, I want to be high density. I'm going to deploy, you know, 15 kW racks in my facility. You know, plan on 6 or 10. And if for some reason the racks don't roll in at 15, you're good because you have the space. If they do roll in at the high density, then you just have some empty space, which is a pretty cheap commodity to, to waste. So hopefully that, that kind of makes sense. Now, there's other attributes that you'd need to do to de fully describe a, a, a pod, right? Not just its size. So one on the power side, I'll just show a couple of examples here, is uh, you know, what are the different configurations that you theoretically could have? So the upper left might be a nice example where you just need two feeds, maybe an A and a B feed uh, of 480, 277 for a North America-based open compute style pod. If you move 
down one, let's see, I'll, now I'll go, yeah, I'll go down one. If you go over to China, this is a configuration uh, that's been done in, in Project Scorpio, where you have your typical IEC voltage coming into the pod. One side goes to a uh, DC rectification system that goes to 240 volt DC. The other side is raw IEC, so the IT equipment actually gets a feed from AC and a feed from DC. In the upper right corner might be a, 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 a more traditional data center that has raw utility on one side, but a UPS on the other. And, uh, and the one on the bottom is just a very traditional type of uh, pod with maybe centralized UPSs and an RPP at either end. And these could all live, well, out, except the 480, well, you know, could all live in the same data center. You could have different configurations in the same room, input voltage, barring that. Pretend it's all 400, 230, makes life easier. So and another aspect is how are you getting the services to the racks? So there's, there's uh, obviously containment for the air stuff. There's a power feeds that, that have to get to each rack, right? It could be busway, it could be an RPP. There's uh, network cabling that has to get to all the racks. So traditionally, you can mount maybe power under floor, networking overhead. Open compute more and more is, uh, especially with the weight, that non-raised floor data centers are, uh, are, are beneficial. So then all that stuff is gonna be overhead. So you see freestanding containments is, uh, is an example of one way to get uh, the services needed to the racks. Now, this is a bit of an eye chart, so don't worry. And these are all gonna be posted on, on the internet, so you can take a picture, but you know, as of Monday, you can download it if you want. <laughs> so this is just a kind of a proposal of, you know, if you wanted to specify this thing called a pod, what, what would you have to do, right? So, you know, what's its input feed? What's its final distribution information? How many racks is it gonna be? What's the average density that you're shooting for? Uh, Potentially, what's the network architecture? This is outside my realm of expertise, but what's the ne network architecture in inside the, uh, the pod? Uh, you know, how are you gonna do cooling? Do I need to deliver air to the pod and remove heat, or do I need to deliver water to the pod? Maybe there's overhead coils, or maybe there's rear door coils. And uh, does it need any type of security? Are there doors, not doors? Is it in a cage, things like that? So this is a, in a, in a template uh, of potential way to specify your pod. And uh, I, next slide on, on some examples on how to do that. So, you know, the input feed, uh, one in or two in, the type of redundancy, where the UPS, does the pod have its own UPS inside? Maybe it's in the rack, maybe it's in the pod, maybe it's upstream from a, a failover perspective. And, uh, and the average density, I talked about that stuff. So, Takeaways from the, from the talk here is, uh, you know, why would we care about a pod? It's just a group of racks. Well, one, it brings organization and uh, operational efficiency to the overall white space within a data center. And it gives you a nice increment of deployment that would allow you to actually diversify the type of architectures you have in the same data center. And that, that might be of interest to people thinking of going to OCP or potentially co-location companies. The second one is from a simplification, you know, a starting point from a planning, you know, there's two power sizes, roughly 150 and 250, and maybe six options with regards to the number of racks and the densities. And that's a great starting point for planning. And then uh, and the last tip uh, that we've talked about in a couple of different white papers is underestimate your density in the planning phase because the floor space tends to be your cheapest asset, you know, unless you're maybe downtown Hong Kong or London or New York City or something like that, okay? So, in with the floor space thing, I was thinking of this uh, earlier in the day when we were talking about 36 kW racks. Now, I would propose that if there is a technical reason from a, from a, a IT architecture to put it all together because the pathways are much shorter and, you, and the IT works better, that makes sense. If there's no other technical reason, I mean, don't just jam the stuff in a rack just because you can. Um, because the asset that you're trying to save, again, floor space, isn't the most expensive thing you have to deal with. So um, just keep that in mind. So one thing I wanna make sure everybody's aware, we have um, a couple of 
facility designs that support open compute. We did this, one, for our own learning, and two, for the community. So those can be downloaded at that website. Uh, I'll jump down to white papers. This topic is about to be released as a white paper. It'll go in a little more detail of, of, of this stuff. And we have a few other white papers that talk about the specification of the modular data center. We also created a brand new trade-off tool on this topic. And it's very simple, but it's kind of neat where you can specify the full power of the pod and understand the input breaker, the number of racks you can get, the physical floor space that the pod's going to take, and also the number of breaker positions that would be needed to feed those racks on the recommended breaker. So it's a kind of neat little simple thing to play around with, and that's going to be published within the next week, um, too. And that can be found at the tools.apc.com. So all free stuff, you just go there. Um, in fact, if you go to those links right there, we don't ask for your name or email address. The marketing people are not going to be happy with me on that. But um, we would like to hear your thoughts on this topic in the presentation here. So uh, if you go to the, sched, uh, the schedule, there's a link to a survey monkey. And if you just give us your comments on this, you can come to our booth and you get a free mobile power pack. So uh, a plug for that. So yeah, we like to hear feedback to see if, if this topic is relevant to you at all uh, and uh, if it's even important, you think, to the community. So we just wanted to throw this out there. Again, the OCP has done great with regards to servers and racks. And we're just trying to explore what's maybe the next thing that's bigger than you know, a rack. So any, uh, I think I've done OK. Any, any questions, comments? Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, thank, oh, Brian's on sticker power rock. So, um, yeah, thank you. It's a, certainly a, you know, an interesting perspective to these, you know, the, the modular, whatever, cookie cutter, yeah. IKEA data center, whatever you want to call it. Um, but, but one thing that I, I fear is, is oversimplified for you know a realistic deployment is like when you show that you know you, you have all these different size and flavors of racks right so it, it gives the impression that you know if I'm designing my data center I have a capped amount of power I got whatever a megawatt to play with and now I have all these 250 or 150 kilowatt pods that yeah. are modular that I can mix and match as I please for from the need right but and understand each pod is you know completely um, controlled, thermally managed, and you know optimized to be super for whatever its purpose is. Um, but at the room level, yeah, um, you know from a thermal kind of CFD analysis perspective, that all those different mix and matching of modular solutions, while while power and you know legally electrician wise are relatively equivalent, are drastically different. Um, thermal solutions and yeah. you know and mixing and matching too much would almost um, I, I would assume without even seeing CFD analyses be you know un, un, unrealistically uh, or, or just just yeah. not viable from a room level thermal solution so can you comment on, yeah. on how you're addressing that or bringing that sure. that reality to the to the uh, the, the, the modular yeah. well, assembler yeah. So we are, we are big proponents of any type of containment, air containment. And so it's air, a good, well-designed air containment is going to be the thing that helps you manage that. If you have some stuff that's um, contained and some uncontained, and not that containment is all perfect, but uh, uh, that's when it gets real sketchy with regards to airflow all over the place in the data center. But containment is the key to give you some predictability in that. Um, but again, not that it's it's completely perfect. But my guess is most data centers, they're not going to be drastically. I did the kind of extreme of low density and HPC in the same room. But uh, yeah. So containment. <laughs> All right. I think we're, we're out of time. So all right. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.